Setting out early can be a risky move, but Google's out of sync launch thrusts the Pixel 9 Pro XL into the spotlight and hopefully ahead of Apple. Here's what it's like to live with in our full review of the Pixel 9 Pro XL. So if you're an ardent Pixel fan and love all things Google, then how about hitting subscribe and join the 300,000 plus of you out there loving our content. We'd love for you to join the team. And then hit the join button if you want to be an ultra legend and get all kinds of goodies and a peek behind the curtain too, as well as lots of free wallpapers on top of that. So one of the big frustrations for me was that Google really, in, in terms of the overall Made by Google event, actually barely touched on the hardware changes during the Pixel 9 series launch event. And to me, that feels a little bit short-sighted because the shiny new suit is an unexpected breath of fresh air. Maybe deep down I wanted to hate the boxy shape as I'm actually a real lover of the Pixel 8 Pro's soft curves and I've loved it in the entire time I've used it. Instead, hyperbole aside, I'm actually blown away at how much the updated size, shape and in the hand feel has impressed me. It's toned, it's firm and it's beautifully flat on all sides. I'll pull one out for the camera bar but at least it lives on in the floating backplate nodule. There's fat trimmed and there's corners tucked here. It's still instantly pixel but with consideration to the future overall aesthetic. The display is almost as good as well as the Galaxy S24 Ultra, but I think it falls short because Samsung has that anti-glare coating. This is still a beautiful, color accurate screen that elevates the content you interact with and consume upon it. And I've made no secret of my love for uniform bezels if you've ever watched any of our previous videos, they're just the icing atop the cake here. The only downside is that you have to deal with a larger and lower display notch, but like all notches or any notches, this blends into the background and doesn't really diminish the quality of the panel at all. Teardowns have also shown that the haptic motors have moved to a new position under the display and I think I'm going to be bold here and say that I actually think for the first time the haptics have now surpassed the iPhone at least for the first time. I'm in love with every vibration based feedback and if you're a haptic lover like I am you will love the Pixel 9 Pro. On top of that unlocks are faster than ever thanks to that new ultrasonic fingerprint scanner through force of habit or just a peace of mind, I will admit that I have registered my thumb a couple of times on each hand. It has helped a ton when using a screen protector, and I do suggest doing this if you do want that added screen protection. I want to ensure that the fingerprint scanner is picking up your thumb, your finger, or any of your other digits when you do register them. Another notable here is that I think the Pixel 9 Pro XL speakers offer some really nice oomph over their predecessors. So if you want to watch a video or listen to a podcast without a speaker or earbuds, I'd say do that cautiously because it is a bit rude to your fellow people in your surroundings, but I will say you're good to go if you do want good speakers on a smartphone. People who are truly invested in the tech space most often complain about Tensor chipsets lack of inherent power and I'm sure there will be some comments down below of saying this. I agree to a point and at over $1,000 I don't think we should hide the fact that Google has lagged behind and isn't putting out smartphones that are comparably powered to the competition, especially those using Qualcomm chipsets. Here's the crutch though to that statement. I don't mind. And most people will simply never notice or be aware that the latest Galaxy phone has a far more powerful processor. Right now, there is practically no discernible difference between the Pixel 8 series and the Pixel 9 because of the Tensor SoC, but it has been tuned and enhanced. So that is great, uh, oh, it's a great thing, because in some ways it's consistent year to year, at least when you move from phone to phone. All of the stuff that I tend to do on a modern smartphone is snappy and precise, but to play devil's advocate for a second here, I don't think you should have to compromise as someone parting with a substantial amount of money for a brand new phone. I think the most obvious of error is the lack of UFS 4.0 storage, which is an especially sore spot. Adopting this newer flash storage would be a super simple solution to resolve some of the instant performance drop-offs compared to the competition. These complaints aside though, when you're using the Pixel 9 Pro XL, the irksome or stubborn decisions by Google are not especially pronounced problems. The company shouldn't really hide behind software refinement though. I'm not saying that they should do that. You just shouldn't be compromising at this price point, which lest we forget has increased year over year and now stands at with the Pixel 9 Pro XL over $1,100. I hate to bring up gaming as well, but it's just not as smooth for a sustained period. Then again, you're likely not going to be looking at this phone anyway if you're a hardcore mobile gamer and benchmarks matter to you. Personally, I prefer my Steam Deck for gaming on the go and maybe some Game Boy emulators running on my Pixel, which I think do run flawlessly anyway. One good thing here is that if you do try and push the Pixel 9 Pro XL, it shouldn't overheat unless it's pushed to its very limits this year. The vapor chamber clearly works as the back of your phone does get warm to the touch rather than actually containing all of that heat in one area and therefore causing slowdowns and reducing performance. This has only happened to me when I 
filmed a lot of 4K 60 FPS video on a sunny day, something that is a rarity here in the UK. And unlike the 7 Pro and 8 Pro, I didn't see any thermal throttling whilst doing this kind of recording. Cellular connectivity was not really an issue for me personally in previous or at least a previous couple of generations. The downside is that I recently changed network providers and now have marginally worse service where I live, so I don't feel confident in declaring whether this new Exynos modem has resolved any problems that you may have. For what it's worth, I've not had any connection drop-offs or inconsistent service while using this with my phone on mobile data. Not getting that latest OS with the latest Pixel is something I have come to terms with, but maybe this does set a precedent. Over the past few years, Google has really been trying to untie or untangle OS updates and provide more meaningful changes within app updates and Google Play service upgrades. A great example of this is QuickShare, which is actually available to all Android 6.0 running devices and newer which means you don't actually have to upgrade the OS to get one of these really cool features. And if Gemini is the future, then maybe we'll get updates for our assistant and improved cloud-based functions rather than wholesale Android rebuilds. And I can somewhat deal with that as long as Google does make this a priority in years to come. That said, Android 14 is practically identical to the build that we've been using on our phones for almost a year now. Thanks to the QPR updates and enhancements, it's now even more refined as well on top of that. I do have a point to pick with Google regarding some of the features that have being added though, we need to get away from the geo restrictions on specific functions and amazing features like that satellite SOS, which are now only available in the US, is a swing and a miss for those of us in the rest of the world. I would love to see, or at least see this as part of the safety functions. And I do think Google should and be aiming to fix this, especially as these phones are getting more and more expensive. So with all the bluster around Gemini and AI functions, it makes the updated assistance experience a little bit weird. Contextually, I think Gemini is great. It's in practice though, it can be basic or it's missing basic functionality. For example, it's annoying when you ask Gemini to do things that the Google Assistant is capable of and get a mealy mouth response and nothing of real use. I don't doubt that this will improve over time, but Gemini is supposed to be ready for prime time and this is the biggest and boldest and probably the best phone that Google is producing this year. Without delving in too much and retreading on old ground, go check out our Pixel 9 Pro review, which has more about the AI stack, which is identical here on the 9 Pro XL. I do think despite the controversy surrounding the reimagined feature that you may have seen online, more guide rails are being added to this practically daily. I do think this probably should have been done prior to launch, but the genie's out of the bottle now. Uh, now we're on to the Pixel camera, a favorite aspect of any made by Google phone, but also one that I feel sometimes could get a few extra tweaks. There are lots and lots of things I love and a few things here I'm still getting annoyed by year over year. The new image signal processor means that the Pixel 9 Pro XL does have better and faster processing than on previous generations. When you take the phone out of your pocket and you hit that shutter button, I think the most important thing here is that 99 times out of 100, you'll get an incredible image, especially with that improved ultra wide angle lens. Although I do prefer to punch in to take photos, I have been known to partake in an ultra wide selfie. So improvements here mean more fun. And I do think you'll get about better landscape pictures as well. The telephoto lens is as good as it ever has been up to that 20 X mark. Beyond this, things do start to break down quite drastically, but there is more detail here than there is on the eight pro when things have broken down and I wanted to enhance those. I've tried using the new zoom enhance feature to clean things up, but it just isn't the feature that I hoped it ever would have been. In fact, it's not that great and you can get better third party sharpening tools and options from the Play Store if you do look around. At first glance, I think your images do look drastically improved, but take a little bit of a second to look closer and things do start to look synthetic and oddly alien, especially human subjects. Realistically though, the Pixel 9 Pro XL camera system's biggest strengths remain its excellent point and shoot capability. On top of that, many social applications have been fully optimized so that your uploads will now look on par or even better than some rival phones. However, as you delve into the extra settings, I do think things start to get a little bit murky. I have no idea what happened to the once excellent portrait mode, but it feels broken now. The edge detection is atrocious at times and you get blurry sections overlapping in images, key components. And I do think you're better off standing back and punching in with that telephoto to get that similar background blur effect. And I do think it looks more natural on the telephoto anyway. When you do this, I think the results speak for themselves. So do this instead, that's my advice. So now we get to the biggest sore point for me with a pixel camera system, and that is the video modes. Video zoom is still broken unless you use video boost. So when you're recording videos, switching between lenses and zooming in or out is choppy as the system actually switches between those physical lenses. If you enable video boost, the zoom clips get smoothed out. 
but that adds an extra layer of upload, process, download, which I think is a bit silly. The same goes for 8K video, and I'm not entirely sure if it's even native 8K resolution, as it could just be 4K oversampled and then processed in the cloud. The standard 4K video I think looks crisp, it looks clean, and the camera doesn't overheat now when you record longer clips. I would really love to see Google add a log profile at some point in the future, but I do think we need more care and attention placed on video on Pixel phones moving forward, especially given how most people record on their phones almost as much as they do take photos nowadays. So like many of the other people fawning over the lifespan of the Pixel 9 Pro XL, I think this could make a two day phone without stressing about finding your charger. The standby time I think is where we've seen the most benefits this year. If you're not glued to your phone or an infrequent user, I do genuinely think it could take a couple of days for you to kill this phone off. And while I hate how flawed the screen on time metric is, for those of you wondering, seven hours has been my average on the low end. In reality, I barely hit 3.5 hours most days and I have 55% left after that time. Anyway, using mobile data exclusively, I don't think does too much damage to the battery. It's really, really impressive in daily usage, but the updated charging, I think that comes with a few caveats. It's not 45 watt as you'll see on the packaging or even 37 watts as Google's notes state when using that new official USB-C charger. In our testing, it appears closer to 32 watts. That said, going from zero to 65% in around 30 minutes is a really big improvement and enough to get me going again in the morning and probably is gonna be enough for you as you'll need that little bit of top up and get what you need to carry on about your day. So to wrap this entire review up, despite how this might sound, the Pixel 9 Pro XL has been a significant surprise to me. Google's really loud and proud about its AI functionality it made by Google, but the core device I think is the zenith of what the series has been able to offer to date. Something I feel like we're saying ad nauseum with each and every Pixel release. At its best, I really will say that I've not enjoyed a new Android phone like this for a long, long time. At its worst, and according to lots of vocal Pixel detractors online and in person, it's yet another overpriced Pixel that doesn't really offer the best of everything. Coming directly from the Pixel 8 Pro like I have, I figured the differences wouldn't be quite as pronounced, but the design changes alone feel like major improvements in ways I really hadn't anticipated. Over the past few Pixel releases, I think a line has been drawn in the sand and Google will continue doing things their own way, whether we like it or agree with it or not. I can't help but think of the Pixel 6 when I'm using the Pixel 9 Pro XL though. And what I mean by that is that this is a phone that feels like a layup, a safe play with enough poise and solid positioning right before what I'd consider a pin seeking Pixel 10, which is coming obviously next year, later down the line. I've really had to temper my own feelings towards the Pixel 9 Pro XL. I'm enjoying it far more than I ever anticipated, but I do know this is not a perfect Pixel. I do hope that Google will reevaluate some decisions over the next year and make them a high priority for the next generation. Even so, despite some of its perceived hindrances, I can't help but enjoy all of the little tweaks and changes for what is a genuinely excellent smartphone. Wipe away the AI and Google has made just one of the best phones period. I want to ask you though, what do you think of the Pixel 9 Pro XL? Heck, even the 9 series at wholesale. Let me know down in the comment sections below. Let's get a dialogue going. I know a lot of people have the different views, different opinions of what the Pixel 9 series was going to bring to the table. And as always, thanks to our channel members on screen now. True legends, I love you guys. But until next time, I will speak to you later.